coming up on this episode of Crime Family. So now we are going to get into some of the things that weren't brought up in the trial, some of the things, maybe new evidence, and some of the arguments for the reasons why people are thinking Scott is innocent. There's multiple people here saying that Lacey was actually there when that burglary was taking place and she confronted them. And, you know, people are saying that that's what happened. But they just don't have any proof because somehow it's all gone. Like, I think the burglaries have something to do with Lacey's disappearance and I thought of that like from the very beginning. One thing about this is a bit creepy is that between 1999 and 2002, seven pregnant women have disappeared from the Modesto area. And someone else said that it should say, the only place where no one can hear you scream. Like, that's really eerie. That's scary. That's super sketchy. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Family. I'm Katie and I'm here with my brother and sister AJ and Steph. And we are now on part four of our Lacey Peterson murder case. Make sure you go back and listen to the first three parts because we go into a ton of detail about Lacey's murder, Connor's murder, about the disappearance, about the evidence against Scott, the evidence not against Scott. We kind of represent both sides. We just talked about the trial and the verdict. And so now we are going to get into some of the things that weren't brought up in the trial, some of the things, maybe new evidence, and some of the arguments for the reasons why people are thinking Scott is innocent. So definitely things that can shed reasonable doubt onto this case. So I'm just going to get right into it because just like the other episodes, it's going to be packed full As we had talked about previously, Scott was convicted in the public's eye from the get-go, but it also seemed as though the jury was stacked against him as well. According to Paula Canney, an attorney and legal analyst who followed this case when it was happening, in the A&E docuseries called The Murder of Lacey Peterson, she explains that part of Scott's original appeal was that his constitutional rights were violated. So when choosing jury members, the judge would ask potential jurors if they were opposed to the death penalty. And if they said yes, then they were automatically excused. And, which which seems crazy. And the question that should have been asked was, quote, Even if you don't agree with the law that there's a death penalty, would you apply the law to the facts in this case? End quote. And so then if the jury said yes, they could not be excused for having a personal opinion about that specific law. But Paula says that this didn't happen here. So the jury was actually made up of 12 people and six alternates that were all ready and believed in the death penalty and were ready to give it if needed. So it's like they were screening, they had a screening process to only get people that believed in the death penalty. That's like a bias from the get-go. Like, these people are riled up and will convict him to death. So that was a mishap right from the the get-go. The second part of his appeal was that a lot of the state's evidence that they brought forward was unreliable and should not have been admissible. Like we had talked about in the previous episode, the tracking dog that wasn't certified. Why was that handler allowed to even testify as an expert witness? So that particular dog named Tremble was wrong 75% of the time when they did these specific tests with him or her. I mean, I love dogs, but this one dog was just not good at its job. Like, it just was not cut out for this work. Also, a part of his appeal was about that experiment that the defense had done showing that it was impossible to have thrown a 150-pound body with anchors attached from the little boat that Scott had. And... So it was about this not being allowed in as evidence, but why did the judge 
allow the jury members to see the boat and test out its stability while it was still on land. So I guess they had the boat, it was just sitting there, and the jury members were allowed to go in the boat and kind of like rock it back and forth to see if it was sturdy or not. But I mean, it's sitting on the ground, it's not going to tip over, it's going to seem sturdy just sitting on the ground. So that doesn't seem relevant, but that was allowed in, but this videotape of this experiment of trying to throw a body overboard wasn't allowed in. So it just seems like just super biased. So I'm just, I'm laughing. I shouldn't laugh, but I'm just laughing because like that whole picture of them just sitting in the boat in the courthouse, just sitting there on the boat. Yeah. Oh, it's not tipping. You know, it must, it must have been pretty sturdy. Like, what the hell? Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. So I actually mentioned it in some of the other episodes earlier. The podcast, Robbia and Ellen solve the case. And uh, they do like a really good coverage um, of this case. They do one episode on it and they do a facts only coverage. So they really do try to stick to the facts as much as possible. And like I said, if you have listened to our show or you're familiar with the Adnan Syed case, then you'll know Rabia. She's an attorney and she um, has a really good track record. Like she has the Undisclosed podcast, which is all like evidence based and they pull court records and actual documents. So she's someone who has a lot of credibility. Um, so I'm not just pulling a random podcast out unless I trusted what she was saying. So I'm just going to preface it with that because I do believe she's a good source of information and she's thorough and fair. So they reiterate like the known facts in this case, facts that neither the prosecution or the defense are refuting. Like a lot of them, the stuff that they mention is stuff that like hasn't necessarily been refuted. They mentioned that uh, records and timestamps confirm that on the morning of December 24th, Scott used his computer in his warehouse, which isn't far from his home, to check his emails and other mundane and rather normal tasks. And he logs off at 1056 a.m. So we know he was there until at least that time. That is like a fact. Uh, the next timestamp that we know is confirmed was at 12.54 p.m. when Scott buys his boat slot ticket. And this is confirmed, of course, by the receipts and the eyewitnesses who saw him there at that time. So we know that Scott was definitely at the Berkeley Marina at 12.54 when he bought that ticket. Plus, Ellen, in this podcast, she maps out the distance and like it's an hour and 36 minutes on Google Maps from Berkeley Marina to the warehouse. So it does kind of fit in that timeline that it could have left the warehouse after 1056 and arrive at the marina for 1254. Also, according to the police's theory that Scott killed Lacey on the evening of December 23rd and that he took her body out in the morning to the marina to dump it, this is just something that wouldn't really make sense because Scott would have to, in plain daylight, carry Lacey's wrapped up body down the marina into his boat and an eyewitness from that day could see directly into Scott's boat as it left the marina. And he says that the boat was empty so, however, this major witness was not called to testify in the trial. Other witnesses say that they could see Scott struggling to get the boat in and out of the marina as it was. And in all of this, none of them claim that they see a body or parts of a body or anything wrapped up in a tarp or anything. So it's actually interesting because this witness says that he could see like from the angle into the boat and it would, he could see that it was just Scott. And um, the argument was, you know, if there was a an eight months pregnant woman who was dead in, in that boat that you would be able to see that from the angle they even actually have where it did test this out i did see there was like photographs where they had like a woman who was pregnant she went into this like same type of boat that scott would have had and like laid in a certain position to see if you could see her laying there from all the angles and i think it was determined that you wouldn't have been able to see it but there were or for most of the angles you wouldn't have been able to see it like from the front or the side, but that it was possible you could have, or even if you saw like like the tip of like her shoulder or something, you won't necessarily know what it is. You'll just see there's something there, but not enough detail to say like that's a dead body for sure. So I did see photos of them doing that test. Um, I don't think that came up in the trial or I know Katie said that they did test it out um, with a boat and stuff like that, but I don't know if they did the specifically like the eight month pregnant woman who like laid in that same position or whatever. So it was just interesting to note that this witness, of course, wasn't called to testify so that they couldn't defend the fact that Scott was there but wasn't lugging a body around in the plain daylight. Also, Rabia and Ellen claim that there are numerous credible witnesses who claim they saw Lacey walking her dog along the same route the morning that Scott went fishing, which, if you believe these witnesses, proves that Lacey was killed, A, after the evening of the, December 23rd, which is the police's theory of when he killed her, and B after Scott left the home to go fishing. So these witnesses never were called to testify and some weren't even called back when they initially called in their information to the police. So obviously the police had tunnel vision like we've already mentioned and just did not care about actually finding out who killed Lacey. 
They just wanted to pin all the blame on Scott, regardless of what the evidence actually proved. Yeah. And another thing about her walking the dog. So I brought this up multiple times. I had mentioned that one witness, Karen Service, said that she had put Mackenzie, the Peterson's dog, back in the Peterson's yard through the gate when she found him wandering around. And she said she had done that around 1018. But because other witnesses had come forward and said that they had seen Lacey walking her dog after 1018, so some said like 1045-ish, the timeline didn't fit. And so the defense did not call those witnesses to the stand during the trial. And they thought that both of those things couldn't be true. So, you know, how could the dog be wandering around and they get put in the back gate that other people see Lacey walking that same dog? But actually, yes, both of those things could be true because... It turns out that Karen said it wasn't unusual for Mackenzie to get out of the house and wander around the streets a bit, just kind of like around around the neighborhood. And so just because the dog was out of the house at 1018 does not mean that after Karen put him back in the yard that Lacey didn't then take the dog out for a walk. So they're thinking that Karen put the dog in at 1018, Lacey does whatever she's doing for a little bit. And then after the dog's already put back in the yard, Lacey takes the dog out and they go for a walk. Also, the regular mailman that always is in their neighborhood, he delivers their mail every like every day or whatever. And he says that Mackenzie barked at him every day that he was there, no matter where the dog was in the house. So if Mackenzie was outside, it would bark. If Mackenzie was inside, it would bark. And on this particular day, when he went by the Petersons' home to drop off their mail. He says that the gate was open and the dog was not barking. And he said he delivered the mail that day between 10.35 and 10.50. So those witnesses could have actually seen Lacey walking the dog after Karen Service had put the dog back in the yard. And this piece of evidence was actually missed in the original trial because it was missed through the scanning machine when they were scanning all the discovery documents. So that piece seems super important, but it didn't get put into the trial. Of course. Because Scott's unlucky, (laughs) of course. Yeah. (laughs) Another thing that they actually mentioned on the uh, Robbie and Ellen Solved the Case podcast was something I actually hadn't thought of too much, but it was a good point, was that during the investigation and all of that, the police are releasing very sensitive information to the public that's typically information that would be withheld in order to keep valuable evidence and details of the case from being public knowledge. So we've seen in other cases, like the police usually always know more than they're saying. And that's because only people closely involved with a crime would know the specific details of certain things. So if a witness comes forward and says something in their story has this very specific detail, then it kind of gives them an idea of like, okay, this is more credible because it involves these pieces of information. So that's usually a police tactic they use because they don't want have to have everything out there for the public to just No. And so we see that all the time. So in this case, the police were releasing a lot of information to the public, including the specific details of Scott's alibi. So that was something being heavily reported on. And it's kind of wild to me because it brought to my mind like the possibility that if this person that's out there who did this crime, if it's not Scott, if they see this information out about his alibi, like could they potentially use that information to plant evidence or dump the bodies in a way that would look bad for Scott? So for example, If this person knows that Scott's claiming he took his boat out fishing in a specific area, and remember he said, like, I went to Brooks Island and I saw this sign, like, the real killer could then go and potentially dump evidence or dump the bodies in that area so that when they get found by the police, it looks awfully suspicious to be found right where the spot that Scott's known to have been that day. Like, to me, it just opens up the possibility of someone potentially knowing that that information and trying to frame him. Like, what do you guys think of that? I never actually thought about that, but that actually, that is a good point. Like, that could be, like, a definite thing that could have happened. That's very interesting. Yeah, I don't think that's too far-fetched because I have, you know, seen in other cases where someone will kill somebody, they will wait until the police search is over in a certain area, and then they'll go back and dump the body because that area's already been searched. So killers maybe think about this kind of thing. And even if that wasn't the original plan of whoever did kill Lacey, maybe they were thinking, like, oh... Scott was there, that's where they think the bodies are, so it's be a good time to do it. So, I mean, it could have just been like an after-the-fact thing for sure, but yeah, I don't think it's too far-fetched at all. Yeah, and I mean, I don't really know how 
how long the police were there in the bay searching. Like, were they there every day, all day? Like, I don't know if it would even be possible for someone to go and dump bodies in that area without being detected, you know? Like, who, I don't know if they had full surveillance or what, but, like, that is... When they brought this up in the podcast of, like, the police are releasing so much information, like, it's not hard to believe that someone could take advantage of that. And, you know, they say, like, oh, the police are really honing in on this guy, or, like, he's getting a lot of bad press. All they have to do is plant a few things, and who knows? You know, it could very easily make him take the fall for it. So it was definitely something that was worth mentioning. Yeah, also, there was um, a group of people, like, Scott's sister-in-law, and she gathered up this group of people, and they were doing a walk around of the San Francisco Bay in the area of that marina, and there was multiple places along the shoreline where you could just, like, pull up your car right to the water's edge, and you could, you know, dump anything you wanted into the water in multiple places, like, along this whole shoreline. So it's not unthinkable that they could have chosen a spot where there wasn't surveillance and, you know, backed up their car and dumped the bodies in and bailed without anybody seeing anything. Yeah, it's definitely like within the realm of possibility, I would say. So it's not out of the question. And then another interesting thing is about obviously the Martha Stewart episode. So who would have known um, that this becomes such a big point of contention? But, you know, Scott says that it was playing on the TV the morning before he says he left to go fishing. And he explains, like we've already said, the episode was about making meringue cookies. And he claims that he and Lacey were watching it or Lacey was watching it and he was just like there and could hear it. But if Scott killed Lacey on December 23rd, which was the police's theory, like, I highly doubt that Scott would be by himself the morning of December 24th watching the Martha Stewart show by himself. I mean, it's been confirmed that the episode did air that day. And that specific episode and the part where she's making the meringue cookies or mentioning it's at a very specific time. So, you know, this confirmed that Scott was watching TV that day to know that information. But it's just a matter of, like, was he watching it alone or was he watching it with Lacey? Like, obviously, that's not a smoking gun or anything, but it's definitely interesting to note. Also, keep in mind that this is 2002, so it's before the time when there were things like streaming or when you could just go on the internet and find detailed information about the Martha Stewart episode to see when it aired and what it's about. Like, now you could go say, like, what episode of this show aired on this day, and you'd obviously get that information right away. But back then, that wasn't as easily accessible. Um, and it's kind of still the days where you watched what was on TV when it was on or else you missed it. So it's highly likely that Scott was watching that episode, but we just don't know if Lacey was there with him watching it. You know, maybe he saw the episode maybe in passing as he left the house or he was getting ready. So we don't know that detail for sure, but it seems unlikely that he would know that information unless he was there watching it that day. But this information tells us he was at the house at that time and was not so busy as to notice which episode of the Martha Stewart show was on. So do you think, like, he's really going to kill Lacey on the evening of December 23rd and then wake up to watch Martha Stewart the next morning? Like, unlikely, I would say. No. Highly unlikely. Yeah, unless you think, again, like, the police are saying that he's just the smartest killer in the world and is just setting up all these little clues to make, to throw people off his track, which I highly doubt as well. There's also a million other ways to do that other than watching that show. So to me, that's just bizarre. Maybe, though, but if you think, if I really want to have, like, a good solid alibi and, like, not mess up my story i could just go through the actions as i would have any other day so that i have like a concrete actual thing that happened even though i was doing other things right like he could be cleaning up the house while watching martha stewart he could have done that just so he you know had that information yeah that's true or like he could have if he killed her the 23rd he could still be watching tv that morning and maybe just flipped through the channels and saw a glimpse of it like maybe as you're flipping through the channels you just hear that's the topic and like that kept stuck in his mind. He didn't necessarily mean he watched it. He just happened to come across it at that time when it was on or something possible too. Mm-hmm. That's true. So also, again, going back to the Rabia and Ellen Solve the Case podcast. This is actually one of the most interesting parts of the whole podcast episode that I listened to um, on this case. And they talk about a witness named Tom Harshman. And this is a witness that didn't testify in the trial, which we know a lot of them didn't. Um, and it wasn't really, you know, information that was kind of out there, of course, not part of the police's narrative or anything like that, not surprisingly. Uh, but he comes forward days after Lacey disappeared and said that on the morning of December 24th, he and his wife, Elizabeth Harshman, they witnessed a light colored van a couple of miles from where Lacey lived. And they noticed it kind of pulled over to the side of the road with a very pregnant woman with short brown hair like Lacey's had. She was kind of like squatted 
down next to the van. I guess she was like peeing or something. And he says that the there was this white man who had a mustache and white hair in a ponytail that was like standing over her as if he was keeping watch of her or just making sure she didn't run away or something. So this witness, Tom, says that the pregnant woman looked very visibly scared. And then when she's like, you know, finished urinating, the man pulls her up and then takes her over to the van. And then he can see an arm from inside the van, like take Lacey or take this pregnant woman and bring her inside the van. So there's like at least two people in this van. Um, So the man with the ponytail then goes around to the driver's side and drives away. So this sighting was allegedly between 2 and 4 p.m. on the afternoon of December 24th. So this is obviously before Scott returns from the fishing trip, but obviously after all the other morning sightings from Lacey walking her dog that morning. And so why this witness would not have called the police immediately or at least follow the van and get a license plate or something at that very moment is obviously strange, but for whatever reason, he doesn't call it in at that time or doesn't really do much of any follow-up at all. But he does call it in days later, and I guess the police just ignore that, like they ignored everything else that didn't point to Scott at all. So what do you guys think of like that piece of information? Because this is a very credible witness um, who saw this van and these men. Do you think that could have been Lacey that, that he witnessed, or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's possible. Like, if she was visibly pregnant and stuff like that, and like she looked scared, I mean, it could be Lacey. But like, I mean, I don't know how many pregnant women were around that day or in the neighborhood so i mean the description sounds like her so and it's crazy to think if he did go to the police what that outcome would have been but it's unfortunate that he didn't yeah and i mean we know that there was at least one other pregnant woman in the neighborhood because like i said the police kind of disregarded all the sightings as oh it was this other woman who was also pregnant who looked a little bit like like lacy except we know there was at least one person who knew lacy personally and confirmed it was lacy she saw walking that morning. So, and what are the chances that it's going to be another pregnant woman squatting next to this van? Like, what are the chances, like, it's nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance? It's like a separate incident. Like, that to me seems highly unlikely. And that doesn't seem like a scenario you would make up, right? Like, this person, it's a very detailed story for a person to just randomly make up and come forward with a couple days later, right? Like, to me, it doesn't scream of, like, a fabricated story. No, but why make it up? Like, there's no really point to making up at all. And so... To me, I feel like it definitely could be a possibility. Yeah. And also the argument that they make in this podcast is that the man who burgled the Medina home, so the Medina family was the family that was living in the house that was got broken into um, across the street from the Peterson home, which we mentioned in an earlier episode. And the men that were determined to be the ones who broke into that home, they were caught for it. They actually are close descriptions of this man that Tom Hirschman claims to have seen standing over this pregnant woman next to the van a few miles from Lacey's home. In this episode, Robbie says that Tom came forward and said that he saw a man with hair kind of in a ponytail. And both of the guys that were caught, they didn't have long hair to be in a ponytail. But other than that, the description like matches. Um, They were both white men. They had like a mustache. So they could match. I mean, by the time they were caught, it was like, I think a week or so. It it was in January. So who knows? They could have shaved their head after this day, right? Maybe to, to... in case anyone saw them to like change their appearance. So just because they don't have the ponytail doesn't mean it wasn't them. But if you like Google them for this Medina burglary, you'll see like that they could very easily be these these people that Tom said he saw. So there could very well be a connection between these men and the man seen outside the light colored van. They also dispute the date of the burglary like many other people have and claim that there's no way the house could be broken into while the large camera crews were there. You know, they were outside the Peterson home, so much media coverage. Like, and if you look at the houses, they're so close together. There's no way that someone's going to break into a house and take all of this valuable property, like a safe and all this other stuff out of someone's house without being detected by the reporters there. Um, so they do like very heavily think that it was on the 24th that the, that the burglary happened, which could mean that like maybe Lacey saw something. So they like kidnapped her to keep her from coming forward. And maybe she was the one that was seen outside the van on that same afternoon. Um, it's definitely plausible. Also, they mentioned that it is documented that one of the first things the two men said after being arrested for the burglary was that they had, quote, nothing to do with that pregnant girl, end quote, which is obviously a weird thing to blurt out. Like, if you don't have anything to do with it, you're not going to bring that up. Like, why do you even mention that unless it's on your mind? Like, oh, maybe they're going to maybe they'll pin us for that, too. So I'm going to, like, try to say that. So it's just really weird that you would bring that up her when you're arrested for something else that's not related to that. 
So that's super a super red flag for them to have said that. So yeah, that's weird in and of itself. And I think it's definitely possible because A, they said that, and B, like we know these men did burgle that house because they had the safe. Like the safe was found in their home, I believe. Um, the home of one of the men who robbed the house. So we know for sure that those were the men who did that burglary. And for them to bring up Lacey seems weird. Yeah, it is super weird. And that A&E docuseries that I've been talking about this entire time also touches on this. So they interview Ed Steele, who was a police sergeant in Modesto at the time that Lacey went missing. And he was the one who actually took the call from the witness, Diane Jackson, on December 27th, when she called in about the burglary that she saw on the 24th. So he agrees that if the burglary had happened on the 24th, it would be very relevant to this case. But the police changed the date of this burglary to the 26th, whether they did that on purpose just to shift the focus back on Scott, or if they did it because something else came up that led them to believe that it was the 26th. Either way, Scott's jury did not hear about the burglary possibly happening on the 24th at all. So when the suspect for the burglary did say that he had nothing to do with the pregnant girl, the officer interviewing him actually said something along the lines of, oh, I'm not here to talk about the pregnant girl. I'm here to talk about the burglary. So they never actually even went down that path of questioning them about the pregnant girl to see if maybe they did have something to do with it, if they knew anything about it. And so they just kind of left it at that, even though it was such a, like a random, strange comment to say if you actually didn't have anything to do with it. And so they just kind of left that alone. And even going further into this, Pat Harris, who was one of the defense attorneys for Scott, he recalls that a couple weeks after Scott's trial was all over and done with, an inmate came forward from the Modesto County Jail with information about that burglary. So it turns out there was a man named Sean Tinbrink while in prison, and he was talking on the phone to his brother, Adam, who was friends with Stephen Todd, and Stephen Todd was one of the suspects in the burglary. So Adam said that Stephen told him that Lacey actually went across the street and confronted them during the burglary, and then they threatened her about it. And as soon as Lacey came up in this conversation between Sean Tinbrink and Adam, Sean starts yelling at his brother. He says, you know, shut up, this call could be monitored, don't talk about that. And someone who actually worked at that prison, a Lieutenant Aponte, he even called into the Modesto police about this because he knew it was significant. He had taped that conversation and called into the tip line in January of 2003, just a few weeks after Lacey went missing. Now, he says that he actually made a copy of the tape and he gave it to the Modesto police but the Modesto police said they don't have a copy of it. And then the original copy of the tape somehow went missing as well. Now, because there was no physical tape and there was no record of who actually called Lieutenant Aponte back regarding this tip, the defense could not bring it up because they really didn't have any evidence. But just multiple people here saying that Lacey was actually there when that burglary was taking place and she confronted them. And, you know, people are saying that's what happened, but they just don't have any proof because somehow it's all gone. Of course, again, I think the burglary theory is getting stronger and stronger. And I think, do you guys, what do you guys think? Do you really think it happened on the 26th? Like the police have said, I mean, it's hard to believe anything they say in this case, but do you, or do you believe that it was earlier, like before Lacey went missing, before there was kind of that media presence all over the street? Well, I feel like if it was a media presence all over the street, somebody would have obviously seen something. But I think it happened before or right around the time that Lacey went missing. Like, I think the burglaries have something to do with Lacey's disappearance, and I thought of that, like, from the very beginning. Yeah, it does seem super plausible. But also, like, if you're going to burglar a house, why choose one that is, like, surrounded by literal cameras and reporters? Like, that doesn't seem very smart. Police are there all the time. Like, you have to be the dumbest criminals on earth to be like, yeah, let's just check out this house. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense either way. Even if they did do it, why did nobody see them? And why would they even do it? So I don't believe the 26 theory at all. Yeah. And there's no way that they wouldn't have seen the media there. Like, there's no way that they, like, went into the house and then, like, or they're like, oh, shit, like, the street's covered. Like, they would have had to see the media circus before going in. Like, there's no way a criminal's going to do that. Yeah, exactly. Like, one of the reporters said, like, there was vans lined up, like, down the street. So, and in front of her house, for sure. So there's no way they would have missed it. People there 24-7, like, even in the middle of the night. So 
Yeah. And I also want to say, like, I don't know how much of how much crime happens in Modesto, California, but like, what are the chances that the house where this woman goes missing and is murdered is also across the street from a house that also gets burglarized around the same time, but they're not related incidents? Like, to me, that seems too much of a coincidence, unless Modesto is just crawling with like people who commit crimes. I actually go into a little bit about how sketchy Modesto actually is, but that's a little bit later. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, uh, to be continued then, <laughs> as we continue this, you shut down my theory. <laughs> so again, going back to the podcast, Robbie and Alan solve the case, which I mean, take a go, go ahead and take a listen to this podcast. It's really good. They have a good discussion and they bring up really good points. So that's why I'm talking so many um, about it so much. Another very interesting argument that they bring up in this podcast episode centers on the discovery of the bodies and their condition. So this next section is a kind of, not necessarily graphic, but it's kind of a, a lot of information, so just kind of be forewarned. But Rabia, before the, doing this podcast episode, she did a lot of research about what happens when a baby get, is killed in utero and how this could impact the decomposition. So just a quick side note. So like in the Adnan case, um, in the Undisclosed podcast, she really brings up really compelling evidence and research about lividity and like how, what it means like when a body is dead and how um, lividity impacts like how the blood pools and all that stuff, which isn't the lividity isn't part of this case, but just saying like she has a really good track record with like bringing up these really good, this like stuff having to do with how bodies are discovered. And while she's not an expert in that, but she's really good at uncovering the evidence and like doing research and talking to experts. So again, I trust her opinion. She says that the research shows that the longer that a body stays in utero after death, the more mummified that it becomes. So if like a baby dies and then stays in like the womb for, for a certain amount of time, like it would become mummified at a certain point because of the decomposition. So there was absolutely no mummification that was found on Connor's little body, which means that if Lacey and therefore baby Connor were both killed on December 23rd, according to the police theory, and then Lacey's pregnant body was dumped in the water on the 24th, then Connor's remains should have some level of mummification because he would have been in utero for some amount of time before being separated from Lacey's body at some point. Furthermore, if his body was separated from Lacey at some point after being dumped in the bay, then his body would still have had some level of decomposition from the water and the elements, which it didn't. So therefore, they argued that Connor could not have remained in Lacey's uterus for any significant amount of time because mummification did not happen. And also, he could not have been in the water for nearly four months because the decomposition was not advanced enough on his body, which is a big important point. So this is interesting because we know that Lacey's body was very decomposed, or her torso was, which means that she had been dead for a significant amount of time before being retrieved from the water. But I can't explain the condition of Connor's remains, like how hers could be so, so decomposed and his couldn't. And obviously, I'm not an expert in that, but I just wanted to bring it up, um, which I thought was important to mention. And I guess their theory on, on their podcast is that Connor and Lacey were both alive for some amount of time after going missing, and then maybe Connor was actually born at some point before being dumped in the water shortly before the remains were found. So I kind of try to summarize it, but we'll put a link to that episode too, so you can listen to her explain it probably in more detail and probably more articulately than I just did. But it's definitely an interesting point for sure that I wanted to mention. That actually would make sense if Connor was born before... They were in, in the water because it was, she's eight months pregnant. So if she's like stressed out or like getting hurt or whatever, like you can go into labor and have a child. Like if your body knows that it's in distress and that can make your body have a child earlier. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that she was born before they were in the water, which is really sad to think of, but kind of makes sense. Yeah. And I think because, like, I guess, yeah, like I said, their theory was that maybe Connor was born. They were maybe held hostage, kept captive before they were actually killed. And maybe their bodies were dumped way later than December. Like, it could have been, you know, although at least he was decomposed. So, I mean, there is that element, too. But then how is Connor's body also not decomposed in the same way if Lacey's was? And I know that there is a defense for that because I know the defense or I saw elsewhere that there is a defense for that or an explanation. I don't know, Katie, if you go in, into that. I don't really go into why, like, why, how Lacey would be dead first and they keep the baby for a little bit and then kill the baby. Or maybe the baby just died naturally without the mother. I don't know, like, that explanation. Yeah, well, I think, like, and the defense tries, I think either the defense argues or maybe the other opposing argument is, like, well, if the baby was, like, 
in utero and like wouldn't be as decomposed because it wasn't exposed to the elements and somehow got separated from Lacey like as the body decomposed as her body decomposed like then came out of the uterus I guess and so we wouldn't be have been exposed to the elements in the same way so I think that's the argument but I don't you said his the umbilical cord was not attached to him? they didn't find it it wasn't attached they didn't find it I mean you like when you have a baby you cut the umbilical cord and then there's still a piece of it there so that to me seems like he was born before he was put in the water or just the harsh reality of him already being like in the utero and but then you the umbilical cord will still be on him yeah so like how does that, that get detached me, unless someone detached it and then you said the placenta was no longer see and that also makes me think that he was born before he went in the water because the placenta also comes out after you're born too but I mean, the placenta could have came out and it's just somewhere in the water because like Lacey's body was in the water. True, but his umbilical cord would also still be. Yeah. Yeah, but when you think about a newborn, they have that little piece that's attached and it just kind of mm-hmm. eventually breaks away and falls off naturally in like a week on its own. So in the water, it would definitely just do that and a whole thing would just be gone. So I don't think that's that hard to believe because it would do that anyway. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I don't know, I don't know AJ if you've ever seen like a newborn baby with like their little the little umbilical cord stubby. No. Yeah, that eventually just like breaks off and goes away, and oh. so yeah, that, it would happen naturally. So okay, in in the water, it would for sure happen. Do you, so do you guys? What do you guys think of? Do you think that there is a chance that maybe they were like held captive for a certain amount of time, or do you think there's nothing to that really? I mean, we don't have a ne- we don't have evidence either way, but I don't want to think about. Like too, they were held captive because that means like they were probably like she was probably tortured, or not necessarily, but to me when someone captures someone after they've seen something or whatever, to me like I, I know I would rather them not be dead, but if something like that was gonna happen, I'd rather them ha- like die quickly and instead of being tortured to death and then die. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, but also like you said, them capturing or kidnapping Lacey could have been enough to put her into labor. She could have died during childbirth. The baby could have lived, came out, survived for a little bit longer, and then died. So whether they tried to keep the baby alive and it just died, or they were just planning on getting rid of the baby anyway, like, we'll never know. It's sad. It's kind of hard to talk about. So I don't know. It's really hard to say. But also, I kind of go into this a little bit, too, because in some of the new evidence that they bring forward for the habeas petition that Scott um, had filed, this is something that they touched on like this evidence. So I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but in November of 2016, Scott's sister got together with a team of people who believe that Scott was innocent. And they go through all of the evidence to try and find things that were missed or not brought forward during the trial. And one thing they talk about is that there was twine that was wrapped around Connor's neck and that was knotted. And then there was also a piece of tape on his ear that was kind of like holding his ears down. And so it appeared as if Connor had been handled outside of the womb. And another thing that the habeas team looked into was that the testimony from a doctor that the prosecution brought forward regarding Connor's date of death. So he was like using formulas and he was measuring bones of the body, the little body they had found. And that doctor concluded that Connor had died on December 24th. But when they looked into it themselves, they found out that his calculation and the formula that he had used were actually wrong. And if you actually did it correctly, then the date of death was actually closer to January 3rd. So if the the date of death was actually closer to January 3rd, then that kind of goes against the prosecution's timeline of they were both killed on the 24th and Scott couldn't have done it if it was later. Scott's defense team felt that this may have been the case as well and they look into this theory of a satanic cult you know once the media got a hold of this theory they kind of blew it out of proportion because it, it kind of seems crazy when you think about it it's almost like the defense is like trying to throw anything against the wall to see what sticks but apparently it was the Modesto police who actually started the investigation into the cult they thought enough of this theory that it was at least worth looking into in the beginning One thing about this is a bit creepy is that between 1999 and 2002, seven pregnant women have disappeared from the Modesto area. 
So there was three that actually lived in Modesto and then four more within 80 miles of Modesto. And there was a woman named Evelyn Hernandez who was also eight months pregnant. And she disappeared just six months before Lacey did. And the defense felt that there could have been a connection here because Evelyn also washed up on the shores of the bay in a similar area to where Lacey was found and in similar conditions. Like her her hands, her feet, and her head were also missing when she washed up, but her baby was actually never found. So super similar, same place, you know, body, same condition. That's sketchy. Only six months before Lacey. And other pregnant women have gone missing so that's it. I don't know. Maybe there's something going on there. Yeah, it seems it could be like a real thing. That's very sketchy. That's crazy. Also, do you think that her and also Lacey, like, do you think they were like decapitated before they were put in the, the bay? Or do you think that they their body, their limbs were just separated like during decomposition or something? I'm not really sure. I don't know. When I was talking about it before, they brought the expert witness into the trial saying that that is not typical of a decomposing body in the water to have limbs and head just like be decomposed enough or eaten by the wildlife enough to fall off like that's not typical so for me i would think that if all the limbs in the head were gone that somebody did it before they dumped them in there although i think like it was only part of their limb like i think part of her arm and leg was there like it was cut off at the elbow or something and the rest was gone i, I think also another thing to mention too is like the tor- lacy's torso was completely clear or like none of the organs were found at all inside her body so and they never found them in the ocean or the the bay at all what really i didn't know that that's another interesting thing too wow that's really weird yeah could be something satanic (laughs) yeah i mean that's what they bring up in the robbie and ellen podcast as well that yeah it was and i'm pretty sure i did see it in another documentary or another podcast but yeah it was like completely cleared out of like they didn't find her heart or her lungs or anything Obviously, I'm not an expert, so I can't. So I can't say if like. What the hell? Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. I didn't obviously see a picture. I don't know if it's like a gutted tor- torso or or if it was just like decomposition. I don't know. I'm not an expert. That's super disturbing. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's normal either. Because I mean, gross as it is, like creatures can get in there and like eat. Because those are soft organs that they probably like, so they could get in there and just clean that out. I don't know if that's something they would normally see, but disturbing. They wouldn't eat a lung, would they? Yes, they'll eat your face. <laughs> they'll eat anything. But also, to, like, when you, like, skeletonize anyway, like, all those organs aren't found either, right? Like, if someone's, like, you bury a body and you find the skeleton later, you're not finding the organs. Oh, yeah, because they all decompose really quick because they're just soft tissue. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that it's, like, because someone removed them, it could have just been the natural state of decomposition. But it was important to mention. Yeah. So there's another podcast uh, that does an episode on this case, um, and it's called Roberta Glass True Crime Report. And they actually take the opposite side, and they say that Scott is definitely guilty. So the episode is called Debunked, in big letters, Debunked, Robbie and Ellen Solved the Case, Murder of Lacey Peterson. So basically, they just spend the entire episode trashing the um, Robbie and Ellen episode of the podcast. Um, I don't know if she has a... Well, I mean, I know she has a personal bandana against Robbie. I guess, <laughs> like what I'm going to explain next. But they spend their time in this episode debunking the theories and the facts that get brought up um, in Robbie and Ellen's podcast. Um, and keep in mind, um, it's important to note that Robbie or Roberta Glass also strongly believed that Adnan Syed was guilty. And we now know that he wasn't. And I actually went and like looked at her Instagram for Roberta Glass because I was just interested. And there's a post from June 23rd, 2023, posted on the podcast's Instagram. And it's a photo of Adnan being released from prison, like the infamous picture where he's getting released um, after his exaggeration, and she put the words of murderer in the picture next to his photo. So that's the kind of person that she is. And we see that she's, obviously she's heavily believes that Adnan's guilty and thinks that Scott's 100% without a doubt guilty as well. So she has, has a guest on this show with her when they do this episode. And they claim in this episode that Scott bought a two-day fishing pass on December 20th and filled in the dates of the 23rd and the 24th himself and so they thought that that was like proof that he could have just went in and fudged that because he wrote in those dates um and they also said that scott had a depth finder attached to his boat um and they also reject the idea that the police were unfairly glued to their theory that Lacey was murdered on the evening of the 23rd 
Um, and I actually did see, like, I searched, and there was a picture of a, like, fishing ticket or whatever it is, um, like a fishing pass um, with the dates of the 23rd and 24th written in, in, like, handwriting. Can't say who wrote that. But, I mean, that is a real thing that exists, so it's not like they made that up. But he also had the receipt from the 24th of the time that he went to the parking lot. So, I don't know. According to this podcast, they also mentioned that the word meringue was mentioned something like eight times on the Martha Stewart show on the 23rd and only one time on the 24th, which means that it could be likely that the episode was actually on the 23rd when Lacey was still alive and likely watched the show. So they think that maybe dates are just mixed up. They also claim that the Peterson home smelled like bleach, insinuating that Scott had spent the day of the 24th cleaning the house with bleach to clean the evidence. But I actually did think this piece of information was debunked and wasn't actually true. Like I know on the crime, on Crime Junkie, they do an episode on this case, or two episodes, and they mentioned that it wasn't actually true, that the house smelled like bleach. And then that was just a fabricator. Yeah. Some of my sources also said that it, that wasn't true. Something the media ran with. Yeah. And something that Roberta Glass is running with as well. She says that it's like in the court records and um, that this was a thing, that the house smelled like bleach. And so Roberta Glass, like I said, she has a guest in this episode of her podcast uh, named Josh Diaz. And he says right at the beginning of the episode that he loves circumstantial evidence and that there are so many people nowadays who he says rely so heavily on DNA and don't place enough focus or attention on circumstantial evidence. They even admit during their episode of this show that um, this is a circumstantial case. And that to me is proof in and of itself that a conviction of Scott shouldn't have happened. I mean, you have to believe beyond a reasonable doubt in order to convict, and circumstantial evidence is not beyond a reasonable doubt, for sure. So even if you don't know if he's, even if he's guilty, like you have to say that there's no way you can, without 100% without a doubt, and beyond a reasonable doubt, say that you know it's him, based on what was presented at the trial, at least, because we know there was a lot of information that was missing. Also, yeah, I've heard people say that they, when they love circumstantial cases, or that circumstantial evidence is easier, because circumstantial evidence is usually like the common sense thing that happened so if all these situations are pointing to this it's common sense that it happened whereas like forensics and dna can kind of sometimes make you think that oh that seems super unlikely but the dna is there so it probably did happen even if it's not common sense and so people love circumstantial cases because it's usually more common sense yeah and i mean i guess it's like you know everyone Obviously, is entitled is entitled to their opinion of you know whether you love circumstantial evidence or DNA, but it's hard to like put a case together and say that so so strongly and believe so heavily that someone's guilty when it's built around circumstantial evidence. That's just my opinion. And so there are some the newest updates in this case. So in a CBS News report that was written only days after the latest updates in this case from January 2024, so it's actually right around the time we were researching this case. Like there's been a break. In the case, or like some new things that have happened and some new, some new developments, um, which we haven't really gotten into yet. But in a news report about those updates, which we'll mention soon. So they do mention that on Christmas Day of 2002, there was a van mysteriously set on fire only a short distance from Lacey's home. And the belief was that maybe the fire was, and, or, and the belief was that the fire was set to cover up some type of crime that had taken place. So my question is, you know, was this the, was this van the same one that was seen by Tom Harshman and his wife? Also, the, reportedly, there was blood evidence that was collected from the van at that time that it happened in 2002. And this is something that's going to be looked at further as the new investigation continues. So that's definitely interesting, too, if this so it somehow maybe the blood evidence can tie Lacey to being in that van and maybe tie it to this these people that Tom says that he saw. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. I'm very interested to see how this. Well, it was funny because when I was re- when I was researching this case, then I happened to come upon that, the new updates, and I was like, oh well, isn't that coincidence? Like we're just doing this case now, and like something new comes up, so it's super interesting to see how this turns out. Yeah, it will be super interesting, and there's even like more stuff that comes out that didn't make it into the, the trial. So according to the A and E docu series, they talk about Modesto like not being the quiet safe little town that some make it out to be and so they say that the city's slogan is actually water wealth contentment health but the locals say murder meth and auto theft and someone else said that it should say the only place where no one can hear you scream like that's really eerie 
That's scary. That's super sketchy. Yeah, this place does have a bad rep from the locals' perspective. Yeah, murder, lots of drugs, people steal your cars, they break into houses, as we've seen. So we were talking about maybe someone breaking into that house across from Lacey's may not be that much out of the ordinary. Even though Lacey and Scott did live in a nicer area of Modesto, just a mile away from their neighborhood was the airport district, which has one of the highest crime rates in Modesto. And so one of Scott's defense lawyers recalls speaking to a woman named Lourdes Avila. And on the same night that Lacey went missing, which was December 24th, 2002, she was also nine months pregnant, eight or nine months pregnant. And she recalls working at her shop just five blocks away from Lacey's house. And there was two men in a car across the street. They were just staring at her and watching her for about 30 minutes straight. And she just had this really bad feeling. And then one of them gets out of the car and comes into the shop looking for her. And she's so freaked out that she runs to the back and calls 911. But by the time the police had arrived, they, the men had left. And Lourdes feels as though they may have been looking specifically for a pregnant woman. And they spotted her, but she was able to get away. And then she's thinking that maybe they went about their day and then they happen to see Lacey so that's like another theory that comes up because it almost happened to her she says even with all of this evidence that we had just been talking about that had been put together for the habeas petition for Scott in December of 2022 a judge actually denied that petition and Scott was also denied a new trial as well yeah I alluded to it a little bit earlier but Um, Just a week ago from the time of this recording, so you'll be listening to this, you know, I think in March, but we are recording it in January. Um, And so just a week ago, on January 18th, the Innocence Project had actually announced that they had taken on Scott's case and are determined to get him exonerated on the basis of several new pieces of evidence. So that's very exciting. It was kind of breaking news, which was just happened. Like we didn't, we didn't plan to do this case because of that. Like we had no idea. We were just in the middle of researching it when it came out. Um, So just interesting timing. But yeah, if you know the Innocence Project, like they do really good work in in trying to overturn wrongful convictions. And they have a really good track record um, as well of doing that. So there is a lot of promise there. And they say they have a lot of new evidence they're exploring. One of those is which is probably the van that was burned. Um, So maybe they'll examine the blood evidence and maybe be able to to present some new evidence to get Scott exonerated. Yeah, I, I do know that the Innocence Project has already filed a motion to have the DNA evidence tested from the burnt out van. So that'll be interesting to find that evidence out. And also Scott's defense team, they like they really believed he was innocent from the beginning. And Mark Garagos, he told People Magazine just recently that he thinks that with the Innocence Project working on this, that Scott does actually have a good chance of being exonerated. So the Innocence Project gets so many requests, so you have to be like really lucky to even get in there. So I feel like it, it actually is a possibility that this could go in the right direction for Scott. Yeah. And of course, they don't really, I feel like they don't really take on a case unless they feel very confident that they have the ability to exonerate because they do have, like you said, get a lot of requests and probably are very busy. So they're not going to take on a task they don't feel is possible. Yeah. They're very picky. And I think they look at things, you know, as much as they can to pick ones that they really feel deserve a, a look at and ones they actually think are innocent. So yeah, it's definitely good news for Scott. I mean, I thought he was innocent from the beginning, so it's nice that other people think that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if the Innocence Project looks into this and then they, they come to the same conclusion, then maybe maybe Scott did do it. So I'm going to weigh my opinion on what happened with the outcome of this. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like because like, they have a good team, they have a good credibility, and I trust them to like make the right call. So if they like look into it and they're like, okay, no. The conviction stands and it's like okay we can feel confident yeah um, or at least more confident <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah so really good news and like i of course didn't follow this case when it first happened back in 2002 i knew the name and i knew a little bit about it but it was never a case i went in depth to so it's not like i you know i didn't wait 22 years to get this news so it's interesting like the time that we are looking into it is around the time this news is coming out whereas some people have been waiting especially you know his family and people who believed he's been innocent have been waiting over 20 years for this break in the case, I guess. Yeah. Like I had heard about this case. I'd heard about this case and was following it like years back. But then 
yeah, kind of forgot about it. It was, wasn't in the news anymore. And then it was back in. So th- yeah, the timing was kind of coincidental for us. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens. I feel like it's one of those cases, like, since it was, like, back in 2002, it kind of, like, shouldn't shape the way of crime reporting, but it kind of, I think this is one of the, the biggest cases that, for me, anyway, that got me interested in crime. Yeah, I also think this is a good example of what not to do for the media. Even Mark Gergo said that if he could do one thing over again, it would be to try and get cameras actually into the trial, because then at least... Everyone would have like a real look at what was happening and not just secondhand reporting from reporters, kind of a play by play. They would actually see what was going on. So it might have made a huge difference. Yeah. And obviously, um, I guess we should just preface it with it. But also, obviously, and if you don't know, which you probably should, but like we aren't experts. This is all just our opinion and everything's like alleged. So we're not saying um, well entitled to our opinion. So I, I guess, and to wrap it all up, to say like, what is your guys' final verdict? Like, obviously, you guys still think he's innocent, obviously, um, after hearing all the evidence and all the stuff we talked about. I actually feel like he is. And another, like, reason why, maybe, because I remember one of his lawyers had said, like, um, you know, even if something, like, if, if this was an accident or something happened and then you just, you killed her by accident or she slipped and fell because you guys were in a fight and something happened, like, you can just say that and we will go for manslaughter and you'll probably get out of jail in like six years. And so that could have been super tempting. But Scott was like, no, like I, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. I don't want to take that kind of deal because I didn't do it. So he could have like that could have been an easy out, but he didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm sticking with like he didn't say like I don't there's not enough evidence to me against him that tells me he did it. And the timeline to me is. That's what I'm sticking with, with the timeline and like him being gone fishing and then she out for a walk. And also like that, the robbery, like that to me is more likely to be what happened than Scott killing her. So I'm going to stick with that. He's innocent. And if for whatever reason, if the innocence project comes back and has the same outcome, well, then my opinion might change. But until then, like Katie said, I'm just going to. I just, I, I just think he's innocent. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, innocent. I for sure think he's innocent, as we've said all along. So I'm interested to see kind of how this news develops and like how the Innocence Project, what they're able to prove based on the new evidence and what they investigate. So that's going to be very exciting. And um, yeah, we've come to the end of our coverage. Of course, we're going to keep you updated. So we'll be, you know, making maybe a bonus episode or an update episode as this continues, because now that we'll be getting updates as the Innocence Project continues in their new investigation and obviously if we get the good news that scott's exonerated um then obviously we'll share that with you and we'll be following along with the case so we hope you enjoyed our in-depth coverage of this case talking about it for nearly probably close to four hours by the time you're listening to this so we hope you enjoyed listening and um let us know what you think do you believe scott's guilty do you believe he's innocent i'm sure those that disagree with us will be quick to tell us on all of our social medias um so we look forward to that but if you agree with us and you think he's innocent as well like let us know or whatever just whatever your opinion is we would love to hear your thoughts about this case because there's a lot but yeah so thank you so much you can follow us on all the social medias um as always we're at crime family podcast on instagram and facebook and crime family pod one on x uh you can become a patron of the show if you would like to support us you'll get some bonus content also get early access so you'll probably get access to our next episode or our first part of our next deep dive If you subscribe right now on the Patreon, you'll get early access to next week's episode. Um, So that's exciting. You can also get merch for the show. We'll put the link to the merch store, also to the Patreon and all of our sources. And um, definitely to take, if you want to go into a deeper dive in this case, we'll put some source, like our resources, and then also probably some podcasts you can listen to that go more in depth about some of the topics we talked about. Um, So thank you so much uh, for listening. And we'll see you next week for part one of a brand new episode case deep dive so we're very excited for that so thank you so much bye Uh, until next time take care bye bye